I want to welcome everyone uh, to this webinar. It's a very special webinar by the Whale Sanctuary Project on uh, whales and dolphins, cultures of the deep. And I'm Lori Marino, the president of the Whale Sanctuary Project. You know, I've studied dolphins and whales for over 30 years, and I'm really thrilled to be talking to, to Hal today about one of the hottest areas in science right now, and that is culture in non-humans. You know, orcas and sperm whales and beluga whales, bottlenose dolphins all have cultural traditions that differentiate groups on the basis of dialect and hunting strategies and other dimensions of their social life. And today, I'm going to be discussing the latest findings on cetacean culture with one of the leading, if not the leading scientist in the area, Dr. Hal Whitehead. On a recent paper, uh, Dr. Whitehead and his co-authors showed that the sperm whales learned defensive behaviors that reduced their risk of being killed in the past, and that those whales who experienced and survived a hunt passed those strategies on to other populations who adopted them. In other words, Whales use cultural transmission to respond to a threat. And this kind of learning was very rapid. And Hal is going to tell us a lot more about this. First, let me welcome Hal Whitehead to the webinar. Hello. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to be here. <laughs> and, uh... It's a great pleasure to have you. Uh, it really is. Let me tell our audience a little bit about you. Hal Whitehead is a professor in the Department of Biology at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia. And his research focuses on social organization, cultural transmission, and deep water whales, and also ecology, population biology, and conservation. His field work is mainly carried out in the North Atlantic of Eastern Canada and the South Pacific from a 12 meter sailing boat. Hal studies cultural evolution, gene culture, co-evolution, and mating strategies. Hal holds, holds a BA in mathematics, a diploma in mathematical statistics, and a PhD in zoology from Cambridge University in England. And he has co-edited a number of seminal books, including Cetacean Societies, Field Studies of Whales and Dolphins, and has written Sperm Whale, Social Evolution in the Ocean, Analyzing Animal Societies, and with Luke Rendell, The Cultural Lives of Whales and Dolphins, which is sort of the Bible of cetacean culture. Your recent paper using archive data to demonstrate that sperm whales quickly develop defenses against whalers and pass those behaviors on to others is really was, was is quite a, a feat in terms of using archive data to infer something about the behavior of these animals. Um, rapid cultural evolution in a sense. Can you tell us about this and some of the work that you've done uh, related to that? Sure, yeah, I, 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 I'm, um, I'm fascinated by whale culture. And uh, mostly we try and figure it out from um, our work at sea on, on, the, on the sailing boat. But um, that's hard work. Uh, <laughs> you, you don't see a lot of the whales at sea. Our, our best route is their sounds. So I'm looking for any route into their culture. And by culture, I mean what they learn from each other and pass on. And um, uh, I was stimulated into this by a, a couple of a talks by uh, two historians who, who looked to historians of whaling. And they said that they, in their reading of what the whales were, whalers were doing, that they got pretty frustrated because um, soon after they started whaling, their success rate, rate went down. And mm -hmm. um, they, these historians thought this might be to do with the whales uh, and the whale culture. And um, so I thought I'd have a look at this. And then I realized there's this wonderful data source. Um, uh, so a very large, well, a, lot, a substantial proportion of the logbooks of the American whalers who sell all around the world in the 18th and 19th century 
uh, were preserved in, in wedding museums in, in, in the New England area and, and, and then were digitized in a fantastic uh, thing called the Census of Marine Life. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are, you can just click on them. They're right there. And so I did this and looked at it. And um, uh, if I do the presentation in, in a little bit, I can explain what we saw. But basically it suggested that these, um, when the whalers, these are Captain Ahab and his buddies, went into the North Pacific in the roughly the 18, around 1820, and they met whales who'd never seen them before, that they found this, uh, it was initially great. They caught lots of whales, great for them, not so good for the whales. But then within a few years, things had switched and they were finding the whales, um, even though they'd found them, very hard to catch. And mm -hmm. so that's what we found. Sorry, that's- Wow. <laughs> I, I, I love that. You know, I'll just, before asking you to get into this more, I, I just have to say that, you know, so when I was in college, the idea of talking about culture in a non-human species was taboo. Um, it just was something that you didn't do. And I just wonder, was that part of your educational upbringing as well? Well, I, th I, th I think, um, you know, I was, my <laughs> initial education was in mathematics where we so, certainly right. didn't discuss culture. <laughs> <laughs> but um, later on, I was doing zoology. And, um, and no, it wasn't discussed, but it was there. Because one of the, uh, when we were talking about animal behavior, one of the, the areas of animal behavior which had been best studied then and is best studied now is birdsong. And they, it was known then that birdsong was culture. The bird, you know, in not all species, but in many species, the birds learn their songs from each other and then pass them on. So it's culture. And that was known, but it was kind of just, you know, that's a weird thing birds do and dum de dum. But you know, and then when people started suggesting this for chimps and so on, ah, and then we brought whales in, ah, um, but it's changed. And now, um, you know, people are talking about the culture of bumblebees. So, exactly. um, it's yeah, so it, things things have really changed. And then, you know, there's still some opposition and, and you know, skeptics, and there should be skeptics because that keeps us honest. But, um, yeah, it, it's very exciting. It is. It's so exciting. I can't believe it. In a short time, yeah, we've gone from culture and non-humans being the third rail. You don't touch, right? Like you said, you don't say it. You don't say the word. Um, <laughs> to look at look look at all we know, and a lot of it is due to you and your and your colleagues. Um, could I ask you to uh, share with us? Um, what your recent paper was about? Sure. Um, so I've got a little presentation. Shall I do that? Um, yeah. So this is uh, says a little bit, a little bit about whale culture and a little bit about the recent paper. So wonderful. Um, then we'll pick I'll up a discussion after that. Okay. I'll share my screen. Okay. Wait a moment. Let's do this. Um, this. Okay, so can you see a screen which says the cultural lives yep. of whales? Yes, and yeah. this may be just there. Okay, so um, uh, first, sperm whales. So many of you know about sperm whales. I think of them as the animal of extremes, in, and I could go on about all the extremes there, but I think key ones are that they have the largest nose on earth. And this is um, just in front of the largest brain on earth, which is, 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 is Laurie's speciality. And this huge nose is used to make the uh, most powerful sound of any animal, the clicks of the sperm whale. They normally use them just to, um, uh, to find their food, which are deep water squid but I'll talk about another use in a moment. 
But first, uh, uh, well, perhaps it's not an extreme, but the, the, the thing about sperm whales that fascinates me, and that is that they are super social. Um, and when they're at the surface, which is only a, you know, less than half of the time, they spend a lot of time socializing. They swim together, they touch each other, they'll kiss each other, they'll make these sounds I'll talk about. The basis, and, and, and so I've been fascinated by this, this social structure for many years and tried to work out sort of how it works. Um, the basis of this social structure is what we call the social unit, which is a, a, about 10 females and they're young uh, who are typically related. So grandma, her daughters, their daughters and young sons. And they, they do, they're pretty much everything together. They're nomadic, so they'll swim over thousands of kilometers of ocean together. Um, they will communally care for the babies. So if mom's down feeding, someone else will be babysitting. They will, the females will suckle each other's babies. And then, as we'll talk about in a minute, if they're attacked, they will defend themselves communally. Um, and I'm just going to give you a hint as how to, how we do this. So this is our, our, the research boat we use. And we go up for about two to three weeks with a crew of five. And we listen for the sounds of sperm whales. And when we find them, we follow those sounds and we can follow a group for about two weeks. As we follow them, we record their sounds. We take pictures so we can photo identify them and say that's Judy and that's Jane. And uh, we pick up little bits of skin that they slough whale dandruff and can use that to look at the genetics of the population. Well, I, um, I mentioned the clicks. So not only do they use the clicks to find the food, but they use their clicks to communicate with each other. And they do this in patterns. So here we, uh, here we have, um, here we're sailing off or, or, or in my favorite research area, which is the Galapagos. And um, you follow, you might hear this kind of thing through our hydrophone, my underwater microphone. Clicks. Clicks. And those clicks are regularly spaced. I don't know if you heard that click, 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 click. So uh, we, there's a, a bunch of social units off the Galapagos who make their patterns of clicks, what we call coders like this. And we call them the regular clan. But there's another bunch of social units off the Galapagos and they make clicks in a slightly different pattern. Listen to this and see if you can figure out what the difference is. So there are a few other kinds of sounds there, but mainly you heard those patterns of clicks, but these were a little bit different because in, instead of being regularly spaced, they went click, 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 click. There was a, a pause at the end, um, kind of like uh, people here in Canada put an A at the end of a sentence. So uh, we call these the plus one. And so off the Galapagos, there are regular social units and plus one social units um, in the same waters, but they never interact or we've never seen them interact. So if you find a group of sperm whales, there may be two or three uh, regular social units or two or three plus one social units, but never do they mix. We've also found that the different clans behave differently. So the uh, regular clan tend to stay a bit closer to the islands and they wiggle around and they have their own particular way of, of babysitting their calves. The plus one are a bit further offshore, moving straighter lines, so actually easier to follow. And, and again, there are social differences. We've 
you looked at the genetics and there's no difference in the nuclear genes which could govern behavior between the clans. So something else is different. And what is different is their culture. So the young sperm whale is growing up in the social unit, which is part of the clan, and she's meeting other social units from that clan, and she's learning this is the way we, say in the plus one clan, do things. And then later, she will pass it on uh, to her offspring um, and uh, her relatives um, as she grows up. Well, so that's the basis of the picture we found. And now I'll talk briefly about this study that uh, Laurie mentioned. And um, I'm going to introduce it with a couple of clips, which perhaps you recognize, perhaps not. Ever since the beginning of time, man has pitted himself against the power of the sea to learn its secrets, to solve its mysteries. Many stories have been told of ships and the men who sail them, of sea beasts and the men who hunt them, well, I've stopped it there because this is the first crucial moment. There she blows. They've seen sperm whales. So now what they're going to do is they're sailing around in their whale, whale ship and they're going to lower their flimsy whale boats into the water and chase the whales and try and harpoon them. So moving a little bit along in the trailer for the 1956 movie of Moby Dick, this is how it looks. And I've stopped it there because that's the second crucial moment I'm going to talk about, which is the harpooning or striking. So um, what we looked at in, in, in this big data set from the North Pacific is what happened after the whalers sighted the sperm whales. Did they strike them? Did they harpoon them or not? And so we used this large collection of digitized logbooks of the American whalers. And we looked at the time just after they first went into the North Pacific. So initially, the whales are naive. They've never met anybody like Captain Ahab before. And so here's my graph <laughs> as a statistician. On the um, vertical axis is the strikes per sighting date. So given that they saw um, whales, how many were they likely to harpoon? Well, in the first years they were in the North Pacific, it was about one. So every time they sighted one on that day, they would, on average, um, harpoon one whale. But within very few years, just three or four years, it had gone down to um, over half, less than half that, 58% drop in success. So the whalers were not happy. They were doing a lot worse than the very first guys in the North Pacific. Um, obviously the whales were probably a bit happier about this, but they were still getting killed. And so we looked at possible explanations for this. And these were the four that we came up with. Um, first, that the, those first guys were the best. Well, we checked this, they weren't. When they were in other parts of the world, they didn't do better than they were. Second, that the vulnerable whales were killed first, you know, the young or the old or the stupid or something. And that didn't fit either. We then thought, well, the social units learned individually. If they'd met a whaler, they knew how, better how to do things next time. And that didn't produce a, a drop this fast. Instead, it's the last thing that makes sense. The, the best model we could fit to the data was the naive social unit and social unit who'd never seen any of these whalers before, rapidly learned effective defensive measures from experienced mm -hmm. social units, social units who had seen the whalers before. So this brings up the question, what did they learn? And probably um, the most important thing was to stop doing what they had been doing. The, 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 the most important um, threat they faced previously were killer whales. And we've seen 
uh, killer whales attacking sperm whales, the sperm whales form a very tight group at the surface, put the baby in the middle and bite off the killer whales with their mouths or their tails. And it works pretty well. But that's the very worst thing to do with uh, Captain Ahab. You give him a nice big slow moving target for him to throw his harpoon at. They can alarm each other. They can flee and especially flee upwind with the uh, whalers found harder to row upwind. They can make deep dives and they, they can also attack the whalers who were in pretty flimsy boats. And, and the, the, the whalers themselves describe the whales as doing all of these things. And it seems that their ability to learn these things passed very quickly through the population. So we have rapid cultural evolution on a very large scale right across the North Pacific. So just a summary, the females live in cultural clans. These determine much of their behavior and probably it determines their identity too. So for a, young, a sperm whale, she grows up, she thinks of herself as a member of her social unit where she'll spend most of her life, but also a member of say the plus one clan. And we have particular ways of behaving. Mm -hmm. And these cultures do evolve and they can evolve very rapidly in the face of a new threat. So um, that's my little presentation. And now I will stop sharing my screen. There we go. Thank you. Well, Hal, thank you so much for that. There's so many questions that come out of that and, and we'll be able to take questions uh, in a bit. But, you know, I, I it just, you know, it's, it's it was so clever to, to take a look at, you know, archive data to try to infer something about the behavior of these animals. Um, is this method something that you think we, I mean, is there more data out there that we should be mining? Well, I, I, the, I think, uh, the, you know, one of the things about the, the, these guys um, of the 19th and 18th century is they had a lot of time, right? <laughs> they were out for three years. Most days they didn't see anything. So they had plenty of time to write down what they did see, and many of them did it meticulously. Uh, they had no, modern whalers had all kinds of reasons to falsify their data, and they did because there were regulations. You mm -hmm. can't kill right whales, you can't kill baby whales, so every time they killed a right whale or a baby right whale, they call it a big fin whale or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but the old guys didn't have any reason to falsify it and they didn't. So it's wonderful data. And, you know, we found out one thing we can get from it, but I'm sure um, there's all kinds of other things that we can be got from it. And, um, you know, uh, people cleverer than I will figure out all kinds of other secrets in there. Well, I, I'm not secrets, but, um, uh, you know, weighs into the actual behavior of the yeah. whale. Yeah. Well, you know, during your presentation, you mentioned females and matriarchy. And a lot of people are very interested in the fact that uh, some cetaceans uh, seem to have uh, go into a menopause. And the suggestion has been made that when they do, uh, they become the primary caregivers uh, and cultural uh, holders, holder of cultural traditions for their grandchildren and then pass that on from one generation to the next. Can you speak a little bit about that in, in the sperm whales that you've studied? Um, well, not so much in the sperm whales because we don't know too much about it. In the sperm right. Whales. <laughs> right. We don't have really good data on menopause in sperm whales. It may be there or it may not be there right. or it may be partially there. Um, the really good data are for killer whales. Yes. And there's a, a wonderful study of um, where they show that the leader of these groups of killer whales searching for salmon is usually the old menopausal female. She's yes. The, and then when things get really bad, because the salmon are doing too well, um, the, she, her leadership becomes more and more important. So uh, it's, it, it, uh, she is vital um, 
to the success of her relatives because of the information she contained. So it's really important that she's there and it's more important that she does, you know, she provides this information, this leadership than just, uh, you know, uh, trying to produce uh, more offspring at an age when, you know, she's not as well suited for it. So this is the grandmother effect. Well, it's partly the grandmother, but partly. there's another side of it. There's a mother effect. In fact, it's shown that the young male, well, the male sperm was in the prime of life. So these are males of 30 or 35 or so. So they're at prime breeding age. Yep. They're, you know, if their mother isn't around, they're in bad shape. They're quite likely to die. So it, you know, it can help. Uh, her presence not only helps her grandkids, but also her kids directly. Now, right. um, with humans, it seems um, uh, menopausal females, it is a bit more of a grandparent thing than a parent thing. Um, but uh, in, in the way, at least in the killer whales, it, it works both ways. Yes, yes, right, exactly. And uh, that's very, very interesting. Um, you know what? I'm interested in the first time you realized that you were observing culture in a cetacean species? Um, the fit, uh, yeah, well, so it was back in the late 90s. We were kind of, we were working out the social system of the sperm whales. And there seemed to be evidence for some level there that we couldn't get our hands around. It didn't make sense from you know, the stuff I learned in college about how animal social systems are organized, right? So the right. social units kind of make sense, you know, going around with, with your female relatives, you know, in certain circumstances, that makes sense. Um, something else um, above that, which was lumping these groups of females together. And, and, and until we suddenly realized wow, this lot make this kind of coda, and this lot make that kind of coda. And then we, um, uh, we found out all these other things that differed between the different clans. And then we, we checked the uh, genetics and so could show that uh, uh, they weren't different in the nuclear gene, which governed behavior, that we said, hey, we've got culture and it's completely uh, delineating sperm well populations, sperm well society. Wow, wow, and that was back in the 90s. Well, um, that, the big discovery happened, I think in 2001, when yeah. um, I remember first getting an inkling of this and running up the stairs in the dreadful concrete building I work in to Luke, my, my <laughs> colleague, who's still my close colleague, who, who is up one floor and saying, hey, look at this. And then he took it and ran with it, and yeah. It was yeah, very cool. Yeah, yeah that, that must have been so incredibly exciting. Um, yeah, Luke does wonderful work. Well, you know, you mentioned genes, right? And, you know, you're very interested in gene culture evolution. You know, for our audience, can you explain what that is and, and, and how that comes into play in your work? Yeah, well, so um, uh, as... Um, evolutionary biologists, um, I think, uh, well, evolutionary biologists think of genes as this, um, a, a, as this process flowing through a population, right? So the genes are transmitted from parent to offspring and then from them and so on. So the genes flow through the population. And as they do this, there's a whole bunch of evolutionary um, effects which to change the genes, like there's mm -hmm. mutations, there's natural selection, there's drift, and so on. Well, uh, so genes uh, are, are a form of inheritance, and they govern what um, individuals look like and what, how they behave, and so on. Well, culture is the same. So culture is also a form of inheritance. It gets one animal to be behave like another animal, and it's transmitted by learning from each other. So that's the method of transmission rather than having sex. It, 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 it's through learning, and then they can transmit it to another. So we've got these two forms of inheritance, the genes and the culture running through the population. 
And the idea of gene culture coevolution is that these two can interact. So the cultural evolution affects the genetic evolution and vice versa. So, uh, well, that's the basic idea. And um, uh, in sperm whales, we've mainly been using it to look at a as a potential cause of why there's so little diversity in the genes which, the uh, mitochondrial genes, which go through the mother's line in sperm whales. And the thought is that what's happening here is because some clans have um, much better ideas than other, idea uh, other clans, they spread. And so the mitochondrial genes being spread through the mother also mm -hmm. spread. And so that let, you end up with much lower diversity. And there's many other, well, there's a number of other forms of gene culture coevolution and it can get quite complicated to say the least, but th that's the basic idea. Yeah, is this, is this what some, uh, some folks out there might call epigenetics? Well, some would include it in that. Yeah, so epigenetics is another way in, um, it, it depends how you define it, but epigenetics right. can be thought of as any um, heritable stream other than genes, right? That's right. actually right. literally what it means outside right. genes. Um, right. So some would, you know, and I'm, I'm no problem with that, could, it would include culture in epigenetics. Others would put them a bit separately, but that's, yeah. you know, that's the semantics. But it's, you know, the thing about cultural evolution is that it is evolution um, and it is behavior that is based upon learning. So this whole notion of other animals having these built in propensities and not even propensities that they're just, you know, stimulus response. I mean, that went out the window a long time ago. And, you know, we see animals who are spending a good deal of their time, especially, you know, when they're juveniles, doing a lot of learning uh, how to be a proper whale. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about the other kinds of whales that you study. I mean, sperm whales, they have the largest brains in the world. Absolutely fascinating. There's so much we don't know. And then there are the beaked and bottlenose whales. Um, and when I did my dissertation work at the Smithsonian, those whales had really strange crania, really strange skulls. They were like the odd. Weird as hell. Yes. <laughs> weird as hell. Little yeah. oddballs. Tell us about the, the you, you study the northern bottlenose whale. Where do you study them? What do you know about them? What strikes you about them? Well, um, and this um, is not the bottlenose dolphin, folks. No, this, right. These are these are big, big animals. animals. They're about, you know, not as big as a sperm whale, but they're sort of eight meters long. They're, yeah. you know, 25, 26 feet long. They're, yeah. they're, <laughs> uh, but they look a bit like bottlenose. You know, they have a beak and, and they have a nice rounded head, uh, but they're fatter. They're, you know, as one of uh, uh, the students call them, they're like bottlenose dolphins on steroids. <laughs> and uh, I started studying them for two reasons. One is that not too far, I'm looking at my window out at the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean here from Nova Scotia. Nice. And way out there, about 100, 200 miles out, where the water becomes deep, that's where you find the northern bottomless whales, yeah. which seems like a long way, but it's a lot less far than the Galapagos. So when I, I started work here in Nova Scotia, I wanted to have a project close home. So that was it. And secondly, um, as you know, evolutionary biologists, one of the ways we try and figure things out is what we call the comparative method. So we compare things in different species or subspecies. And at that time, there was a general feeling that uh, the bottomless whales were in some ways the most similar to the sperm whales in many ways. They were deep divers, they were social and so on. So I thought, huh, well, if I study bottomless whales, um, I'll find them just like sperm whales. So, you know, perhaps it's the deep diving which sets up the social system in sperm whales. That was our theory. And, you know, it would set it up in, in bottomless whales too. But when we found out uh, their social system is totally different. It's not like sperm whales at all. Instead of being matrilineal, they, uh, these females have a sort of um, a looser network of friends and the males have, have tight uh, mm. alliances. 
So in fact, it's much more like the social system of the bottlenose dolphin, uh, surprisingly enough. So we were completely wrong on that one, but they're quite wonderful animals, the bottlenose whales. They're extremely friendly. Mostly the sperm whales, if we get close, um, ignore us or, you know, if we get too close, they'll, they'll flee a bit. There are a few which are friendly, but bottlenose whales are always friendly. Or oh, not always, but nearly always. They'll come around and circle the boat and make rude noises and look at us. And so on. <laughs> it's quite delightful, but really hard to study their natural behavior because they aren't behaving naturally when we're around. Um, anyway, I, I yeah. The, so, um, you know, we're looking for um, um, cultural signs in bottlenose whales, but we haven't found any yet. It's much harder with that social system to find them than in, in the sperm one when we got these clans, which are separate and you can look at the behavior of the different clans and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and uh, you know, rule out the gen genetics and then you've got the culture. Mm -hmm. But with, just as with bottlenose dolphins, they found lots of culture in bottlenose dolphins, but only in studies where they really know the individuals super, super well. So, uh, and we don't have, we haven't, you know, I've spent a lot of time out there, but we don't have them that well yet. Uh, Do you think that uh, having a more matriarchal society has something to do with whether a population or a species has a culture or not? Um, I'm not sure. I think it, 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 it it's very much promotes um, certain forms of culture, the culture passed down um, from parent to offspring, but yeah. we can learn from others. So for instance, we know that humpback whales have rich cultural lives, but exactly. most of that is, some of that's learned from the mother, but a lot of it isn't. They learn from each other. Right. And, um, uh, you know, from their buddies. And uh, um, so um, certainly the ones with matrilineal social systems like sperm whales, killer whales, um, it's much easier for us to find the culture. Yeah. But whether they have more culture, I, I, you know, I'm not dead sure of them. Not, not sure yet. Um, this, this last question is, is important to me. You know, we've talked a lot about, I mean, you're an advisor for the Whale Sanctuary Project, and we have uh, collaborated in, in various ways, uh, uh, looking at the ethical implications of uh, what it means to keep these animals in captivity. You haven't shied away from discussing the ethical implications of your, uh, of your work. And you recently written a number of chapters in different books about understanding whales and dolphins as cultural beings and the moral imperative to protect them, not just as biological organisms, but as cultures, because when, a, a, well, I'm gonna let you say it. It's a, it's a profound and important point. Yeah, well, um, for, for, for these um, a species, as for our own species, culture is vital, right? So a human with, without culture, a human who has learned nothing, who has been somehow fed as an infant and so on, and is just, Put out there is going to die. Mm -hmm. I suspect the same is as true of a sperm whale, a beluga whale, a killer whale, and perhaps any whale. We don't know that for sure. And um, so their culture is vital to them. And um, just as with us, the, their culture is really important. So we depend, as I look behind you, I see all kinds of elements of our human culture in your room, you know, <laughs> keeping plants in pots, um, chairs, um, fridges, and so on. And um, uh, those uh, are all part of our culture as our legal systems and so on, which allow us to lead decent and productive um, lives and survive. Um, and it's the same for the whales. So they need their culture. Mm -hmm. And as we know that when in certain circumstances, our cultures will die. So there's a lot of attention and rightful attention, I believe, being paid to protecting indigenous languages, which are dying out all over the world. Yeah. Um, and the also 
more generally the information of these indigenous people, which can really help us at times, say if we're trying to find a, um, a, um, a, a, a new drug to cure some disease, then that indigenous information may be vital. Similarly for the whales, that information that they have is vital for them. And there's um, concern that's been expressed by people like Phil Clapham that whaling destroyed that. As the whale numbers went down, they lost information, for instance, about where to go. So I wonder about the right whales here off, off, off Eastern the North Northern America. America. Part of their problem is they've lost this information about the different places they can go. They still have a few, but some of the places they used to go are no longer in the cultural uh, memory of the right whales. Exactly. And they are in yeah. big trouble. They are. They yeah. are, yeah. Thank you for that. Let's turn to some questions now. Um, there's a, a, a question in here uh, from uh, William who asks, can you correlate some of the sounds the whales make with specific behaviors? Yeah, well, we, we initially we thought we would do this, right? So we're going click, 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 uh, click, 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 click. And we thought, oh, maybe that means come over and babysit my calf. Okay, I will. Um, and so we were in, in this sort of language mindset. And, you know, we, if we had that for many years, we were working on it. We didn't really, you know, there was one which might have been a sort of hello, but that was about it. And, um, but now I, I think we've, well, we've come to the re realization that perhaps we were wrong and we were looking at the wrong way. And instead of using uh, language as a paradigm, we should use music. And these patterns, they're very simple, but they're extremely rhythmic. And um, so, and then we look at how they use, they use more like uh, human music. They used as duets or an animal um, yeah. uh, uh, making repetitive patterns. And then if we look at how uh, humans use music or say birds use song, then you can get the kind of, so it's about relationships about bonding. So for instance, one whale will go click, 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 click. The other one will go click, 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 click. And then they will make their two coders on top of each other, exactly aligned. And our feeling is that's a bonding thing. That's us buddies together, right? So the, the actual pattern may tell them, okay, I'm your plus one clan, I'm plus one clan, cool. Um, but the way they used is about uh, asserting these bonds, which are so vital to them. Yeah. That's that's fascinating. Um, here's a question from Gabriel who asks, do sperm whale watching tourism and diving activities have a noticeable impact on their behavior and their culture? Uh, and he, he specifically mentions sperm whales living in the area of the Dominican Republic. Okay, um, I think what he means general, is, is Dominica. That's Dominique, where the, not the Dominican yeah, Republic. Yeah, right. and, um, yes. yeah, there's a lot of, and uh, we know the um, sperm whales there fed really quite well from the work of my colleague Shane Giro. That's um, right. And so we, he, Shane's been studying them um, since 2005, so 17 years now. And um, the, uh, the, the, the Swim With program there started, I think, about 2012, something like that. So he had about, and yes, um, so it, it, uh, it does change the behavior of the whales. Mm -hmm. um, most of them, well, many of them don't like it. So when the people come up to swim with them, because the boats doing this get much closer than the standard whale watch boats, mm -hmm. they're there for much more of the day. So the standard whale watch boats in, in Dominica maybe do a one hour, a one and a half hour trip in the morning and then one and a half hour trip in the afternoon. So, you know, um, and, but they, and they also stay away a bit, Shane's, you know, worked with them to, to develop ethical codes of practice and so on. And they, they do a pretty good job. The swim with people do it very differently because they come up, you know, they've got to get the people in the, even in the lovely clear waters, of the Caribbean, you don't see all that far. So you've got to be pretty close to see them. So they put the people in close. Um, and also though, the, these operations are happening much more of the day. 
the, you know, much of the daylight, not just an hour in the morning and an hour yeah. in the afternoon. And what we, so yes, they do affect the whales and uh, it doesn't affect their culture. Well, there is, some of the whales do like it. You know, there are whales there who, who mm -hmm. um, like going, you know, think this is cool. Oh, yeah. Go over to the whale watchers and give them great <laughs> pictures and, and, you know, interact with them. It's, it's you sure. know, the whales yeah. like it. And obviously the whale watch people love it. And, um, and that's nice, but um, it, I'm not sure it's so great in the long term because yeah. the culture is built up where um, Shane's noticed some of these whales who like it, bringing some of the younger members of their pod over, saying, look, this is cool, come and do it. And then the younger ones think it, and so they're, and I'm not sure it's such a great idea. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I'll leave it there. Yeah, I mean, especially nowadays when everything is, problematic. I mean, there are so many stresses on free ranging animals. Um, and to, to add another stress is, is questionable, let's say. Yeah, it is. Uh, but, uh, you know, I can see, you know, I, I, when we started off, um, well, 30 years ago now, I, 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 I swam a bit with them. And I was, the, even though I'm a dreadful swimmer, it was the most cool thing of all. <laughs> and so it, it's, it, you know, I feel a bit hypocritical telling my grad students who'd love to go and get in and teach. Yeah. Saying, no, we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> when I had, you know, when I was their age, I had those yeah. wonderful experiences. Live and learn. <laughs> right. Yeah, well. True. True. Um, here's a question from Dante. He asks, is there any affiliative or avoidance behavior between uh, between the regular clan and the plus one clan. Do you think that the cultural differentiation between those two groups would actually inhibit any communication between them? Yes, I, th I think I think he's put it the way I see it. We, you know, we, we can't follow them all the time, and even when we are following them, uh, we don't we miss a lot, to put it mildly. Yeah. But um, they do seem to not go close together. And um, um, so, I, you know, my working hypothesis, and we haven't proved this, but is that the, the, there is this sort of us and them thing. You know, we are the uh, plus one clan, they are something else, and we mm. stay away from them. And you can think of multicultural societies in, in, in some, um, say North American cities where you have different, you know, cultural groups, but who tend primarily to interact with each other. Right. And um, I, we've never seen any aggression again between them. So, um, um, you know, but and, and similarly in, in, in human multicultural cities, in, you know, aggression between the different groups is very rare. But on the other hand, most of the socializing happens within them. So yes. that's the kind of pattern I'm I'm thinking of. Although um, uh, one of the graduate students who works with me, Felicia Machon, seems to have found a a, a new clan. Uh, well, in the Caribbean, in Dominica, there's one main clan um, which Shane discovered a while ago, and then he discovered a second one. He, he they're not as uh, um, named as, 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 as richly as the Pacific ones, so EC1 and EC2. And Felicia found a third potential clan, EC3. Mm. EC3 and EC2 seem to have a bit of a relationship. So it may not be the, uh, you know, the, the different clans are not only different in how they behave, but how, how they live, you know, how they interact with the other clans. Right, right. And that could depend upon a number of things. All kinds right. of things. Well, yeah. we know how, you know, cultural, strange cultural stuff sweeps through human societies, right? Everyone starts doing hula hoops or whatever exactly. it is. And <laughs> there's no <laughs> clear reason for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, of course, our species is, is sometimes not great at multiculturalism. Um, and, and that's a, a sort of another issue, uh, another dimension to this is, you know, when we learn something from these whales. Um, I'm gonna ask a question here by somebody who wants to know about pinnipeds or 
other marine mammals and whether or not we've found evidence for culture in seals or sea lions and those kinds of animals? Yeah, that's a really good question because uh, um, I have this theory, I'm not sure everyone agrees with me, <laughs> that the ocean is a particularly good um, habitat for culture, that um, culture is particularly useful in the ocean. So why not the seals, the great white sharks, dum dee dum Well, I think part of it is to get, and, and there may be some culture there, but I think a part of the problem is uh, that the whale cultures are very, they're not all um, based on this, but most of them are based on the mother calf um, relationship, which is extremely strong, right? Um, um, you know, uh, cetacean uh, fathers are dreadful, but the mothers <laughs> are fantastic. And, um, uh, and, and non-existent. And, uh, <laughs> the, the, you know, the young well li or dolphin lives with his or her mother um, for a long period. In the case of the sperm whale, for a while they're both alive. Um, but, you know, in bottlenose dolphins for four to five years and so on. And in this, this gives a wonderful um, opportunity for learning stuff from the mother to the offspring. And, and people like Janet Mann have, have documented this learning. So, uh, you know, uh, the way it doesn't work that way in seals. <laughs> seals, to, with a very few exceptions, when they go to sea, they leave the baby on the ice or the yeah. land, right? So they, the mom suckles fine. She does a great job of that. But then when she thinks the pup is, is fat enough, she says, okay, you're <laughs> now. And so the, um, the pup hasn't been to sea with the mother. Now, there are a couple of exceptions. The most obvious is the walrus, where the mother and pup swim mm -hmm. along together. So my guess is that among the pinnipeds, the most likely place to find culture would be uh, in the walrus. In the walrus. Uh, yeah, and then, and we do know the walrus sing songs, and so that might be part of it. Um, and another marine mammal where it does happen um, are sea otters. And uh, so we do know, you know, the sea otters have very, um, uh, sophisticated and particular ways of making a living. You know, some of them feed on this and some of them feed on that. And they have particular ways of smashing their food or catching it and so on. And they pass that on uh, to, to, to the young, you know, from the mother to the offspring. And so, the, you know, that's a, a form of culture. Um, so those are a couple of exceptions. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a really fascinating question. Um, and, you know, we still don't know a lot about that. And the whole question of, why do you get culture in some animals and, uh, and not in others? And what shaped that in, cetacean, in some cetacean species is, you know, I happen to think it doesn't have anything to do with being in the, in the ocean. And that's another fascinating, uh, you know, topic of, of debate. Uh, it could be both. Um, and uh, it's, it's really, really very interesting. Um, you know, just speaking about not being in the ocean. Um, what, and given what we know about uh, echolocating bats, for instance, um, do you think, and I'm, I could say something about this as well, you think that the cetacean brain developed due to a, a change in communication style? Well, I mean, this was one of your great discoveries, yes. <laughs> is this sudden wolf in cetacean brains. What was it, about 28 million years ago or so? Sometime it around was then. about, well, about 32 million years ago, okay. there was a Not big right. change. There was, I mean, it was a significant change, right? The brain got yeah. bigger, modestly so, the body got smaller. And, you know, talking about... Um, that, that your very, very interesting hypothesis about an aquatic existence giving rise to culture. It's absolutely fascinating. What we saw in the cetaceans is that when the new, the neocedi or the, the early new forms came into being, that's when you see 
the brain changes, the body changes, the inner ear changes, the dentition changes. There was a complete change in their whole lifestyle, given what we can infer from, from the fossils. It's absolutely fascinating. And, and seems like once you had those changes, then the kinds of cultural, the kind of cultural evolution that you, you're talking about becomes possible. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think there's, it, it is this, um, these complex feedbacks and yeah. it's really hard to sort of pin down which is more important. And perhaps they're all important. They just work together that, um, you know, it, it, with the odontocetes, which is where you've done most of your work, I believe, that, that, that you, you have this sudden development of echolocation, which changes the whole way you make your living and mm -hmm. changes the possibility of socializing and the, the significance of socializing. Um, and so that changes all these other things you talked about, but including what they're learning from each other. Exactly. Um, and, um, and that's the culture. And then once they have culture and that becomes important, that again can, and, and can, can favor different kinds of brains. So you get ev evolution, natural selection for kinds of brains, which are good at dealing with culture at good at social learning and so on. And, and then you get the, the idea of menopause evolving because that's another way to keep the information flowing. And, and uh, yeah. Once you get into a certain adaptive space, then that affects what happens afterwards. And then you get these feedback cycles. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's fascinating. It's complex. Um, can we ask for your time for another couple of minutes? Sure, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, here's an interesting question uh, from uh, Frank, and he says, do you, can you, have you observed what sperm whales do when uh, another whale is injured? No, I haven't, I'm afraid, okay. so I, I, I don't really know that. Um, okay. Uh, it would be wonderful to observe yeah. that and see, see what happens, yeah. Is there? Um, you know, I do know they defend themselves communally when they're attacked by killer whales yeah uh, but that's rather different okay well we'll we'll go with one more question here and then uh we'll wrap things up this is from uh lennon enrique and and this person asks i once saw a presentation of you <laughs> dr hell whitehead on the question of morals in sperm whales what's your take on that well, um, the, the thing that comes to mind most is the, um, uh, that wonderful great nose producing these incredibly loud clicks, the loudest sound made by any animal. Mm -hmm. And um, if you swim with them and they, they, you know, they click on you to kind of figure you out and um, it's, a, you know, it's like, boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pretty damn sure they're not using their full power at that point, but they are using their full power down, down when they're um, feeding and they um, have to listen to hear the clicks and make sense of them and find out where the food is and hear each other and so on. So their ears are incredibly important. Mm -hmm. So if they, turn this fantastic sonar system and did it in each other's ears, it could be certainly temporarily deafening, but maybe, you know, provide um, wow. a hearing injury. And uh, so the way I envisage it, you've got a bunch of sperm whales feeding down there together and they've got to be damn careful. Um, and, and I think of it as a bunch of hunters in a forest with submachine guns. I mean, unless they have a pretty clear moral code about what's going to happen, things are they're going to be accidents. A lot and of it. I, I think, uh, um, and and other, uh, you know, Ken Norris before me suggested this. That yes. There's some kind of moral code about how and when you use your sonar system uh, when you're feeding together. Yes. Um, there'll be other um, other um, instances where morality will come into play, but that's the one that sort of strikes me most vividly. 
Well, I mean, that with that food for thought, that would be a good a good place to end, even though I could sit and talk with you forever. And when I get back to Nova Scotia, um, I'll be yeah. in your okay. office and we'll be talking and talking and talking. But um, Hal, I want to thank you uh, for the honor of interviewing you, for you telling us about your, your groundbreaking work. Um, and... I want to thank all of the participants, all of the registrants for your interest and your questions. I wish we could have gotten to all of them. We tried. <laughs> we never really do. <laughs> but it is, it is really a pleasure. And uh, I just uh, want to wish everyone well. We'll have a recording of this up in a few days. And again, Hal Whitehead, thank you so much. And to everyone else, thank you as well. Be well. Thank you for listening. And thank you, Laurie, for arranging this. Uh, it was a great pleasure. Thank you.